All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. My name is Kelsey Tyler, and I am Assistant Director of Public Programs at Humanities Texas. Welcome to this evening's program. Tonight's program is one in a series that we've held over the past year on sports and the humanities. So again, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. I would like to now introduce our series moderator, Aram Gudsuzian. Dr. Gudsuzian is the Bizot Family Professor of History at the University of Memphis, where he writes and teaches about the United States in the 20th century with a focus on race, politics, and culture. He is the author of a number of excellent books. One of the most recent is The Men and the Moment, The Election of 1968 and the Rise of Partisan Politics in America. He has also published well-received biographies of Boston Celtics star Bill Russell and iconic actor Sidney Poitier. Along with Jamie Schultz, he is the editor of the Sports and Society series published by the University of Illinois Press. Aram has participated in a number of Humanities Texas programs over the past few years, and we have been delighted to work with him on this series of lectures. So with that, Aram, I will turn things over to you. Thanks so much, Kelsey, and good evening to everybody. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here as usual. This is the fourth installment of our Sports in the Lone Star State uh, lecture series, which, is, which has been a Q&A interview style series uh, to great effect. Uh, and we've just, just we've discussed a host of topics: uh, the Texas sports revolution with Frank Garrity, um, the history of the Cowboys and the Oilers uh, in the '70s with Scott Sosby, uh, with Juan David Coronado. We looked at baseball on 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 the border uh, of the Southwest, and, and today we turn to our conversation with Stephen L. Davis. He is the literary editor of the Whitliff Collection at Texas State University San Marcos. Uh, and he's the co-author uh, with Bill Minitalio of a book called The Most Dangerous Man in America, Timothy Leary, Richard Nixon, and the Hunt for the Fugitive King of LSD. They also wrote together a book called Dallas 1963, which won the Penn USA Award for Research Nonfiction, a very prestigious award. And it appeared on a whole host of uh, best book lists in 2013, where it was the 50th anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Uh, he's edited a number of books. He's written a well-received biography of Frank Doby, uh, the famed Texas folklorist and intellectual freedom fighter. And most important for our purposes tonight, he's the author of this book, Texas Literary Outlaws. You can also see it in the background behind Steve. <laughs> um, the subtitle is Six Writers in the 60s and Beyond, and it chronicles the lives and the careers of the so-called Mad Dogs. Uh, six writers that included Billy Lee Brammer, Larry L. King, Bud Shrake, uh, Gary Cartwright, Dan Jenkins, and Peter Gant. These Texas writers all made a sort of significant national literary impact, and to varying degrees, sports writing uh, was influential in shaping their work, their style, their outlook. And that's the, the, the big theme that we'll be exploring here today. Uh, before I ask Stephen questions, just another reminder, make sure that you can uh, to put in your questions into the Q&A box. You certainly do not have to wait until the end of the Q&A session. You can drop in your questions at any time, uh, and if possible and relevant, I'll, I'll incorporate them in the midst of our discussion now. We'll also definitely reserve time at the end for your questions, uh, but your questions can go into the Q&A box at any time. And again, if you, if you bring them in in the midst of our discussion, I can try to incorporate them as feasible. Well, let me, let me ask Steve a question to, to get started, and that is sort of how did this sports writing aspect of the story get started? In a lot of ways, it seems to begin in the newsroom of what was then kind of a second-rate afternoon newspaper uh, in, in, the, in the second city in the Dallas-Fort Worth hierarchy, uh, the Fort Worth Press, and, and, with a, and with a guy who wasn't one of these mad dogs, a guy named Blackie Sherrod. So how does, how does the story start with him, Steve? Um, good, good to talk with you, Aram, and I appreciate the invita invitation, and I'm a supporter of Humanities Texas, so glad to be involved in the program tonight. And, um, you know, that's, a, that's such an interesting question you, you ask about Blackie Sherrod and the Fort Worth Press. And, you know, really, um, I think we kind of need to look at what the Fort Worth Press was, you know, calling it a second tier newspaper may be a bit generous, uh, really. This was uh, really a third rate at best newspaper that was so inadequate uh, in terms of competing against the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. And, uh, you know, it was in a old rundown building across the street from a flop house. Um, it was such a 
just tightly run place with, you know, reporters weren't paid very much. Uh, I remember Bud Shrake saying that, you know, when you worked there and you needed a new pencil, you had to turn in the nub from your old pencil in order to actually get a new one. And um, it was just, you know, the thing that really distinguished the Fort Worth Press, if you can call it distinguished, was its sense of sensationalism. This was the afternoon paper. So the Fort Worth Star-Telegram had gotten a scoop on the news already. So people turned to the Star-Telegram for updates on what happened. So the Fort Worth Press, to, to get readers, they were just as sensationalistic as possible. You know, they would run a banner headline about a tornado, even if the tornado had occurred like on another continent. And, uh, you know, Bud Shrake tells the story of the time when he was a police reporter there. And he did a fairly routine dispatch about the time a Fort Worth cop hit a deer that was near a neighborhood park, you know, killed the deer. The deer was actually still in pretty good shape. So, you know, the cop picked it up, took it back to the station. He and his buddies divided up and they all had venison. And, you know, Bud wrote a little funny piece about it. And that banner headline for that story was cops eat kids pet. So this is kind of the news organization you're dealing with here. And um, Blackie Sherrod was kind of a no nonsense guy. Um, he was a World War II veteran. You know, he was a gunner in the Navy. He had killed people. He had seen people killed. And when he came back to Fort Worth and started working as the sports editor at the Fort Worth uh, Press, you know, he saw the idea of people chasing a ball around a field is just kind of a silly thing. And so he had this sort of above the fray viewpoint of, of the sporting contest. And so his idea in terms of being on the afternoon paper was nobody's going to turn into the turn to the Fort Worth press to find out who won yesterday's games because everybody already knows. So his thought was, you know, let's, let's entertain these readers who, who come to our sports page and they want to hear about the game that happened yesterday. So he would basically uh, just do a lot of commentary in, in his columns. He would begin with it. He would try to find a great magnetic opening line that would suck you in and then just this kind of steady stream of clever one-liners to keep the momentum going. And he would just offer all kinds of commentary, sometimes on the game, sometimes not. But to him, it was just a way to provide this kind of bright, sparkling, daily commentary in the newspaper. And it was a, it wasn't a unique style, but it was a pretty rare style at that time. And, and a lot of this, people have said later, really uh, sort of fed into what developed into new journalism, this idea that you don't really pretend to have objectivity like reporters were supposed to have for so, so long. And, you know, you just indulge in your opinions and lay it out there. So there's Fort Worth Press and there's Blackie. And he did bring along this crew of crazy sports writers who went on to do other things. And, you know, really we should talk about Dan Jenkins here. Um, you know, Dan Jenkins, who was just fresh out of high school when Blackie hired him at the Fort Worth Press. And, you know, Jenkins said that when he got hired, you know, he spent, Jenkins been on the the Fort Worth Pascal Pantherette, the student newspaper. But he, before he reported to work, you know, he wrote up his story. He spent all night polishing it and doing everything he could. He took it in and he gave it to Blackie. And Blackie said to him, basically, he said, uh, he looked at it, read the first paragraph, and he told Jenkins, don't ever write a morning lead for an afternoon paper, dumbass. And, you know, that was the great lesson for Dan Jenkins. He realized at that moment, yeah, we're not reporting the scores necessarily. And so this was the beginning of kind of a rough education um, that he and Bud Shrake and Gary Cartwright all had at the hands that Blackie shared, where they really did um, get into this world where you were just kind of unshackled and, and you were asked to write commentary, to be opinionated, to present yourself as above the game and just offering this kind of often sardonic commentary. And, um, you know, Gary Cartwright said years later about the, his time at the press, he said, we survived on the assumption that no one read our paper anyhow. It's the same feeling you get on a college newspaper or on mind expanding drugs. There are no shackles on the imagination and there's no retreat, only attack. And so this is kind of where these guys were on this paper, but I have to say at the same time, um, you couldn't do politics. You couldn't write about race. You couldn't write about anything meaningful, really. I mean, you could write a whole column on how difficult it was to open a package of crackers, but you couldn't write about, you know, why black teams couldn't play against white teams at that time and things like that. And, um, so, you know, it, it had its limitations in that regard. But in terms of like learning how to, to write in a really bright way that captures readers' attention, this was a great education for all of them. Yeah, and 
in terms of writing about politics, right, the sports page was in some ways um, behind the times in the 1950s. And obviously that would evolve over the course of the, of the, of the 1960s when black athletes forced the issue uh, in, uh, in concert with the civil rights movement. Um, we see Jenkins and Shrake here in front of us, uh, and they both go on to a uh, storied careers uh, with the magazine Sports Illustrated. Um, how did this happen? Um, what was what was going on with Sports Illustrated uh, in, in that era? Um, and it, as you tell that story, you can tell, kind of tell the story of Jenkins and Shrake, right? They, they have intertwined lives, intertwined careers, very similar in certain ways, mm -hmm. but very distinct in others. Yeah, you know, they were really lifelong best friends. They met at Pascal High School. Jenkins was a couple of years older, and he was, you know, the very cool senior. And, um, you know, and then all of a sudden he was, you know, working at the Fort Worth Press. And at high school, they bonded because they both had the same dream. Uh, you know, they're both very sarcastic. Um, and they both imagined lives for themselves where they would live in New York, and basically be famous writers. And um, their idea of being famous writers was slightly different. Dan Jenkins always wanted to be like a celebrity sports writer. And Bud's idea is he actually wanted to work for the old New York Herald Tribune, which was a great newspaper back in the day. And he wanted to be a foreign correspondent for them and just travel the globe and write novels on the side, you know, be it like a well-respected novelist. And so, so they kind of had that difference in the beginning. Um, and, you know, when Sports Illustrated uh, came along in 1954, um, you know, a year after this picture we're looking at, what's interesting about that is at a national level, that was doing the same thing that Blackie Sherrod was doing at the Fort Worth Press because Sports Illustrated came out a week after all the games had, had been played. So this was the ultimate afternoon newspaper. And so people turned to Sports Illustrated for, of course, the great photography, but also to read the best possible commentary on these sporting matches that happened. You know, you wanted to get an inside view of the game. You wanted great analysis. You wanted something that was going to make you feel like you, you were getting privileged information when you were reading these writers. And, and, you know, when Ken Jenkins saw Sports Illustrated, he realized instantly, this is where I want to be. And that was 1954. And, um, you know, it took him a while to get there. Uh, I think it was January 63 when he moved to New York as, as a new hiree. And, you know, Jenkins had a very long, I would call it an apprenticeship at the Fort Worth Press. You know, he was there 13 years, which, you know, is, is, is a long time. And the thing is, when Sports Illustrated was looking to hire writers, you know, Jenkins was already a really great writer. But I I never really found out exactly why it took so long for him to get hired, but I have a feeling it had a lot to do with him being at that third rate paper, because once he finally did take another job uh, at the Dallas Times Herald, he was at a bigger paper in a bigger, more important city. I mean, he got hired within a few months up at Sports Illustrated. And once Dan got up there, of course, he immediately started lobbying them to hire his best friend, Bud Shrey. And, you know, Bud is, uh, he's just one of those, to me, he's one of the best writers we've seen in Texas. And when he was at the Fort Worth Press, you know, he was a sports writer part of the time, but he was a police reporter for a good chunk of that time. He really learned a lot about the bigger world there. Um, you know, he saw corruption, he saw police brutality towards ethnic minorities. He was in Mansfield, Texas during the uh, standoff to integrate the local high school after Brown v. Board. Bud was on the scene witnessing that and writing about it. So he really kind of had a bigger view, which which fit his vision for a bigger identity for himself besides being a sports writer. Um, but he was such a good writer at the Fort Worth Press. They had him as their rewrite man, which meant that everybody's stories went through him and re he rewrote them. And basically he said he was writing 50,000 words a week, which, you know, in a couple of weeks, that's basically a pretty long novel. So it was a great experience for him. And, you know, he could write about anything from foreign affairs to the winner of a garden club contest or, you know, I mean, he could just do it all. And so when Bud actually got hired in Dallas as a sports writer by Blackie Sherrod, and because he was a good writer, he was, he had been in two consecutive best American sports stories of the year anthologies. So he was getting a lot of attention as a sports writer. But I want to say that, um, when Bud was in Dallas, he really had a, you know, he had a column at the Dallas Morning News, and this is the early 1960s, so 
you know, some of you probably know what Dallas was like at that time. This was a very rabid anti-Kennedy environment, the city of hate, all that. And Bud was writing for the newspaper that was uh, extremely critical of JFK. But because his picture was in the paper as a sports columnist, he was kind of a local celebrity. And, you know, the other sports writers you see here, like Dan Jenkins and Gary Cartwright, went on to write sports novels. Um, what Bud did as a sports writer is he really used his access into the Dallas elite, really. Um, you know, he was hanging out with Clint Murkison, the owner of the Dallas Cowboys, and, you know, one of that cabal of people who were opposed to Kennedy. So he was getting this kind of inside look at these people. At the same time, he and his pal, Gary Cartwright here, were hanging out at Jack Ruby's nightclub. You know, Bud in 1963 was dating Jack Ruby's star stripper. So these experiences, him hanging out with the right wing millionaires, the oil millionaires, him hanging out at Jack Ruby's nightclub, all of this fed into his novel, Strange Peaches. So again, he used sports writing, but sort of went beyond it with, with the opportunity that he had. Um, and then, you know, Jenkins uh, was just a very natural fit. Um, in New York at Sports Illustrated. Um, you know, I think I saw somewhere, this may be in Michael McCambridge's great history of uh, Sports Illustrated, but the idea is that when Dan Jenkins arrived in New York, uh, they called him Broadway Dan because he was, he was at home instantly. He understood where the best restaurants were, how to get the best tables in the best restaurants. He just knew, he was an operator. He knew how to get into everything and everyone. And, um, you know, when he was writing for Sports Illustrated, I actually have this sample sentence I want to read for you. Um, because, you know, Dan was just so comfortable hanging out with the elite. You know, he, he was not introspective. He was part of a, he had a privileged upbringing. He was the establishment. And he was kind of, had this sort of funny view of, of, of things that came with a lot of self-confidence. So um, some of you are probably remember the football player, uh, Joe Namath. Uh, who was, you know, kind of a celebrity and controversial and magnetic in a lot of ways, won a Super Bowl after making outlandish prediction that he could do it against the Baltimore Colts. And Jenkins was assigned to write the profile of Joe Namath. And I want to read this sentence because this is, this is what Dan Jenkins was doing in Sports Illustrated. Okay, here he is. The opening sentence. Stoop-shouldered and sinisterly handsome. He slouches against the wall of a saloon. A filter cigarette in his teeth, collar open, perfectly happy and self-assured, gazing through the uneven darkness to sort out the winners from the losers. You know, and when you have a profile that starts like that, you want to keep reading that guy. And, um, Steve, let me uh, interrupt you just for one second, try to incorporate one of our questions. Uh, the question itself asked about high school football in Texas of the 1950s and 60s, how big it was. And certainly it was you know, a very significant sport, and especially to be covered by local newspapers, right? Can you talk a little bit about how that experience writing about football in Fort Worth and Dallas translates into the, into the their national impact as it goes forward? Sure. I think, you know, really the best example I can think of, and Aram, you may have other ideas. Mm -hmm. Feel free to chip in on this answer um but uh, some of you may know that uh i think it was basically gary cartwright and dan jenkins who again perhaps testing to see if people were actually leading reading the newspaper uh made up fictional teams uh the most <laughs> famous one were the corbett comets and they were led by uh twins dicky don and ricky ron you bet and they dated twin cheerleaders and there was this whole history of the town and they would report their scores against other fictional teams and box, box scores, you know, every week. And they were, you know, outlandish names of the other teams, like what was it, Anthrax or something? I don't know. They just had all kinds of crazy stuff going on and, and crazy scores. And, um, you know, I think Cartwright said later, well, nobody ever really caught on, so it quit being fun after a while. But, but there was this inventiveness there. And then, of course, Dan Jenkins was inventing um, fictional people that, that he would have comment in it as columns you know he had the good old boy athlete um is it billy don puckett is that, is that his name? Billy, clyde puckett? billy clyde puckett yeah <laughs> um, and um you know there's they along with another one of the staffers there jerry todd i think they had a fictional uh, sports writer jim tom pinch mm -hmm. and they created a scrapbook of his fake clippings and you know they were just 
having so much fun and it was just so much playfulness too so uh, what, what's your feeling about that Aaron? I had the same idea the, that the, their sort of inventiveness and their playfulness uh, that grew out of especially the Fort Worth Press uh, years and then sort of the shrink sort of you know, sort of dangling cigarette uh, attitude uh, to the conservatism of, of Dallas in the early 60s. Uh, they kind of bring that 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 energy, so to speak, uh, in, into writing about pro athletes, in particular football. And, you know, Jenkins is huge on the, he's the college football writer for, uh, for SI, right? His two big beats are college football and golf. Um, and he he much prefers writing about the college game to the pro game. Uh, and I think much of that does grow out directly out of that Texas experience, right? Yeah. And I think that, you know, one of his contributions at Sports Illustrated, and again, this is something I'm sure I learned from Michael McCambridge uh, in his history of, of Sports Illustrated, is that Jenkins really, convince the magazine to look at the college football season as this kind of, as a unfolding drama as mm -hmm. the teams advance towards the final climactic showdown. And so it was presented this way where it built momentum week by week. And that was, you know, revolutionary at the time. So. Yeah, you know, I think it's J Jenkins along with maybe Frank DeFord are the two probably the most prominent writers at SI in the 1960s. Uh, and this is the era when uh, Andre Laguerre is, is, has become the editor at Sports Illustrated. In those early years, in the, in the 50s, Sports Illustrated was really searching for its identity in a lot of ways. You know, the, uh, if you look at the internal documents, they're you know, constantly going back and forth about, about what is this magazine supposed to be and what's it supposed to do. And there's lots of pieces about uh, luxury items like and, and a lot of stuff about hunting and um, and tons of golf to try to appeal to those middle class audiences. And they eventually kind of find their voice in the 60s through these you know, compelling narratives of pro sports, especially. Uh, Greg Smith asks, asks a few questions. This is probably a good uh, place to pause and to ask these questions because they're because they were they're sort of questions about Texas sports history in this time. One of his questions is about uh, baseball, professional baseball, uh, which doesn't come up much in your book or uh, or in McCambridge's book as far as, as, as I remember either. But he says, all the great baseball teams in the 50s and 60s were east of the Mississippi River. The exceptions were the LA Dodgers and the San Francisco Giants. Uh, how did Texas writers write about professional baseball? And then a connected question maybe he asks, when pro sports finally arrived in Houston and Dallas, how did Texas writers treat them in those early days? Uh, and I think that one is in, partic in particular can, can, can speak to us, right, about um, – the way that the early years of the NFL and AFL um, shaped who they were in their approach. Yeah, yeah, those are both great questions. And, um, you know, I have to just say flat out, you know, baseball didn't really come up in, in the research and, and to these guys, that's who I was focused on. So I wasn't really looking at the wider world of sports at that time in Texas. So, um, but, you know, it did take a, a lot of effort to have major league franchises established west of Mississippi. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of that has to do with, if you look at the history of how the Dallas Texans got established, as well as the Dallas Cowboys in, in Dallas, because there was only one team that uh, was seen as the Southern team in the country. And that was the Washington Redskins. And their owner, uh, George Marshall, I think it was, had uh, basically monopoly control over expansion. So every time, a, you know, Texas was like growing by leaps and bounds, they had all this money. You know, it wanted to be a player on the national stage and nobody would approve them getting a sports franchise, which was maddening. And that's where you had the, the two different uh, very wealthy men in Dallas, Lamar Hunt, establishing basically creating his own football league, the, the AF, AFL, which became you know, the AFC after the merger and establishing Dallas Texans. And then around the same time when that happened, um, I think that's when the NFL finally agreed to put a team in Dallas to, to drive the AFL team out of business, which kind of happened. And that was Clint Murkison and Dallas Cowboys. So just the idea of getting a toehold in, a, in the market was, was hard. And, you know, these sports writers, you know, uh, Bud Shrake was writing about the, the Dallas Cowboys, uh, Gary Carter was writing about them, but also the Dallas Texans. So they both got to know those guys and, and talk about those two teams going head to head for a while in Dallas, which is a great story on its own. There must be, I'm sure there's a good book on that, but some of you probably know that I didn't know this until I was researching this book, but I thought the Dallas Texans just went away, but no, they, you know, Lamar Hunt got an offer to move them to Kansas city. So they became the Kansas city chiefs. So there's that history. 
Let's talk about uh, a little bit more about Bud Schrag. Uh He seems kind of, in your book, like the, the figure that you most admire, almost like the hero of the story. Um, and I think it's because, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I might be speculating here, but uh, you're you're kind of trying to resuscitate his literary reputation, right? Uh, you're the great admirer of two of his novels, uh, at least two of his novels, um, and. Um, He's of course, you know, involved in this. Uh, you know, he's one of the central Mad Dogs, but he has, a, in terms of thinking about him in sports writing, it's not the same as as Jenkins, right? Jenkins is a sports writer through and through, who branches into different things. Uh, Shrake, it's almost like sports writing is his vehicle into the life he wants to live. Is that is that a, is that a fair way to put it? Exactly. And I'll just tell you quickly my my Bud Shrake story because I am a convert to Bud Shrake. You know, we <laughs> illustrated in the house when I was growing up, and I you know, saw Dan Jenkins at Bud Shrake, you know, kind of in every issue and stuff. So I knew their names. You know, I came to work at the Woodliffe and I, you know, this was 30 years ago. I was a grad student in English. I read all the snotty things you're supposed to read. And, <laughs> I, you know, the only thing I knew about Bud Shrake was that he'd been a sports writer, and, you know, had written a few novels, but I didn't know anything about them. You know, I think I was like, man, 35 or 36 years old when I finally read this. Well, I, I'll tell you that my first job here, and this was such a great experience, was I was accessioning incoming material to the archives. So every three weeks, I, I would get a big fat box from Larry L. King with all of his correspondence. And King mm -hmm. is, is a dream for an archivist because whenever he typed a letter to somebody, he would uh, put in a carbon sheet and he would send the original, keep the carbon and throw it in a box. If he got incoming correspondence, he'd throw it in a box. So I would get, I would get to open Larry L. King's mail basically and see these great letters he wrote. He was so funny. And then I saw this guy, Bud Schrake, was just as funny as King in a different way. And they're both just so damn smart. So I finally, you know, again, late in my life, relatively read a Bud Schrake novel, and that was Blessed McGill. And, you know, I was an English graduate student. I mean, I studied a lot of stuff, and I thought, my God, nobody told me what a really good writer this guy is. And here at the Whitliff, we had this web of, Shrake and Jenkins, Larry L. King, Billy Lee Bramer, um, Gary Cartwright, you know, they're all connected and I could see that web of connections. So that set me off on doing this book. And um, yeah, so I really liked Blessed McGill, which I call the first absurdist Western, you know, but he was a really, I mean, he had a genius IQ and a lot of philosophical uh, interests, I should say, and, and in addition to being able to write really, really crisp, uh, evocative sentences. But you know his book, Strange Peaches, I think is one of the, and I oh, I should say I was a big, long time interest in counterculture literature. When I read Strange Peaches, I thought, well, this is as good as any other '60s novel, basically. And that uh, view of Dallas at that time is just amazing, really. So, so there's my Bud Shrake story. I probably went on too long, but yeah, I I do, I do admire Bud a lot. Yeah. And you sat down and interviewed him for the book, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, him, uh, and Larry King. And um, Cartwright, we're all good. And Jenkins was not really that interested in, he's just, you know, no interest in anything that seems academic in any way, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, let's turn to, get, to Gary Cartwright. We haven't talked about him much yet. Yeah. You described him as a, as a gonzo writer you know, in the vein of uh, Hunter S. Thompson. Um, Absolutely. In what way was he, was he gonzo? In what way was he controversial? Mm -hmm. uh, and there's almost like a tragic ring to his story too. Uh, could you could you give us sort of the portrait of, of, of Gary Carter? Yeah, it's interesting you say that. You know the the, the tragic part. Um, you know, and yeah, Gonzo because Cartwright. You know, Shrake and Jenkins grew up. You know, mostly somewhat privileged circumstances, and Cartwright was you know working class in Arlington. He didn't didn't have a lot of the advantages they had growing up. He really had to kind of like work his way into becoming a writer. And um, he sort of jump-started things by thinking, well, you know, he would he would, he would would do anything. I mean, he would, had a crazy streak. He would do anything to get attention or to entertain his friends. So there were a lot of uh, incidents, we should say. Um, and he's somebody who had this thought, just like Hunter S. Thompson, you know, if I do crazy shit, and I write about it, I'll have material to write about. So that was kind of his approach. And as a sports writer, you know, um, 
to me, he was kind of tragic as a sports writer because he he sort of absorbed the wrong lessons from Blackie and Jenkins, in my view, because when he got called up to Dallas to write about the Dallas Cowboys, you know, he didn't consider any of the social or political context. He sort of treated the Cowboys like like a mean drama critic, you know, um, a lot of snide commentary. And the thing is that Cartwright really didn't see what was really happening at the Cowboys, stuff that didn't really get exposed until Peter Jentz later in North Dallas 40, because Cartwright was sort of blithely accepting at face value Tom Landry's explanations for what was happening in press conferences or whatever, you know, or in interviews. And Landry would sort of always throw the players under the bus, you know, oh, we failed to execute. When Landry was so controlling and had such a tight, such a rigid game plan, you know, he saw the players as chess pieces that they would have to be in certain places and make certain things happen. And of course, the other team didn't always cooperate with Landry's game. So they would get in and things, mistakes would happen and Landry would blame the players. But Cartwright, as a writer, would blame the players too. He loved doing that. And uh, I have another quote I want to mention here from Cartwright, because this was kind of his most famous line as a sports writer. Um, this is when, you know, the Dallas Cowboys were a struggling franchise for a long time. They finally started to make it into the playoffs. Uh, you know, I was a little kid when this happened. I can't remember some of this. Um, but, they, you know, their nemesis was always the Cleveland Browns. And then one year in the playoffs, they had a chance to beat, I think Cleveland fumbled or something. Dallas got the ball at Cleveland's one-yard line, first down, a chance to win the game. Don Meredith, the great quarterback who you see in the picture here, you know, takes the the snap, steps back, throws the pass right exactly to where Tom Landry told him to throw it and right into the arms of a Cleveland linebacker who didn't follow Landry's game plan. You know, Meredith throws an interception. Landry, again, throws Meredith under the bus like he always did. Uh, it's very kind of sanctimonious in that way. Um, and, you know, Gary thought he was friends with Don Meredith and nobody else really thought that. I mean, Meredith would hang out with him because Meredith and Bud Schrake were friends, you know. Uh, but Cartwright wrote this lead um, after that game. And this is one where he recalled sort of what a, a, a famous earlier sports writer, Randall Rice, had written about Notre Dame. And Cartwright wrote, um, here's, here's the opening sentence of this story about this loss. Outlined against a gray November sky, the four horsemen rode again. Pestilence, death, famine, and Meredith. So. Yeah, that was, that was tough. And I have to say, you know, Cartwright later became a fantastic magazine writer. Um, you know, it, it took him a while to really find his voice and to figure out who he was as a writer. But when he started writing for Texas Monthly, he had a great editor, William Broyles, and uh, everything just came together for Cartwright at that point. And he went on to have a hugely successful career in Texas as a legendary journalist at, at uh, Texas Monthly. And, um, you know, so there's that. If I'm not mistaken, he wrote a famous profile of Dwayne Thomas, right? Who was uh, the rebellious running back for the, for the Cowboys. Is that right? right. Yeah. 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 And uh, was that for, was that for sport magazine? No, that was for Texas Monthly. I'm sorry. Yeah. I think I, it was for Texas Monthly, if I yeah. remember right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And this was, you know, Dwayne Thomas was a fantastically talented black running back who was a great player. Um, and he was the one who called Tom Landry the plastic man, I think was his yeah. name. <laughs> and, and he went, at some point he quit speaking to the press, but he talked to Cartwright. And, you know, Cartwright really couldn't write political stuff before, but writing for Texas Monthly, he could. So that was a big part of him, finding his voice. Yeah. Another one of your characters is Larry L. King, who you mentioned, of course. Um, and he's not really known as a sports writer. He's best known for his, for his political writing. Uh, he's in his heyday at Harper's Magazine under Willie Morris, uh, and he wrote The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas afterwards in the, in the 70s. But sports shaped his career too, right? Uh, yeah. How was sports writing part of the Larry L. King story? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, King, uh, such an interesting life, you know, mm -hmm. kind of. Think of him and Bud as my favorites of the writers from this group, although they all have many things to recommend them. They're the ones that speak to, to me the most. But, you know, King uh, grew up poor in West Texas. Uh, he liked to say he was born on the first day of the first month of the Great Depression, you know. Um, and basically, he was, yeah, he was big. Uh, he was a football player. And um, 
there was a practice common at the time. I think it's still done today. It was called laying out or laying over where you deliberately fall just short of graduating your senior year. So you can come back and play a second year of high school football. And King been pressured to do that. He did it. And then over the summer, he thought that was a mistake. You know, I don't, I don't want to come back and spend another year in high school. So he enlisted in the army. Next thing you know, this country kid from West Texas gets sent to Fort Dix uh, in New Jersey. And on weekends, he's going into uh, Greenwich Village uh, in the early 1950s. And most important, well, both of these are important, Greenwich Village and his uh, army unit, uh, Harry Truman was president. He was getting ready to desegregate the military and he wanted to have a couple of test units and see how that would work. So King, who had, as he said later, just absorbed all the racial poisons uh, growing up white in Texas, deep racial poisons was suddenly reporting to a black sergeant. And it was such a growth uh, opportunity for him that he took advantage of, you know, to his credit. And that really changed his life, um, along with spending a lot of time in Greenwich Village. So after leaving the army, he comes back to West Texas. He's in Midland and he gets hired as a sports writer at the Midland Reporter Telegram. And, you know, one of the things I love about King is he knew already, I mean, he, he figured out from his life experience that sports was, sports is political, you know? And so he's covering sports in Midland. The all black high school has a talented uh, basketball team. King tells the editor, let's run a photograph of, of the, the team. These guys are great. And they tell him, we don't do that kind of stuff here. And then he's supposed to write a profile that the first ever Mexican American varsity player for the high school team. Uh, King writes the profile, you know, this kid, he's hardworking. He works at a local restaurant. Oh, but you know, he can't eat at that same restaurant where he works. And they, and they tell him, nope, you can't do that either. And, you know, and so basically what happened to Larry King as a sports writer um, is, yeah, he got fired. He got fired from three straight papers in West Texas. Uh, he, like Bud Shrake and Gary Cartwright, became a police reporter, which was uh, hugely important in his wider development and understanding of society, too. Uh, and King had a great quote, which I don't have here, but he talked about what David Halberstam, another great journalist, had written about what happens when you're a small town reporter, general reporter, or police reporter, you just like see everything in society. And that's just such great experience when you go into the wider world because you see a lot of the same things replicated uh, just at a different level. So it was a great experience for King. Um, you know, he did go into Harper's and had a terrific career there. And he wrote things like, uh, you know, one of the things I love about King is that he was, he tried so hard to be honest about himself and. And he didn't cut himself any slack. And, you know, after Martin Luther King got killed and then Malcolm X got killed and there were people rioting in cities and stuff, you know, King, you know, he had been to Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech in Washington. He had like done things to, you know, for civil rights. And so he was going to write this petulant piece for Willie Morris at Harper's, the great editor at Harper's about how, you know, I tried so hard. I've done so many things for black people. Now they're all writing and they, they can't pick me up from the other whiteies. What's the deal? And he said, you know, I wrote down to write this lie and the truth emerged. And the truth was he realized while he was typing that he was not nearly as uh, evolved as he thought he was. He was still affected by these deep racial poisons. And he wrote this amazing piece called Confessions of a White Racist where he went back to his earliest memory of what a black person was, what he heard about that black person and just took you through his life in this way. It was an amazing article became an amazing book that in 1972 was a finalist for a national magazine award and sold not a, you know, it just, it was not a book America wanted to read. And, you know, and we can talk about a book America did want to read, you know, if you want to talk about other books that came out around that same time, like Dan Jenkins, semi to, you know, which may have been the same year or a year later, I think something like that. But so King, you know, ironically, he was writing all this great stuff, just not getting much traction from it financially. And then he wrote as a lark that the play that became Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. So there we have it, which does have football in it. <laughs> That's right. The Aggies get to go to the whorehouse after they beat UT in the big game. <laughs> And, you know, in that play, too, I think the players' names are Cartwright and Shreve and stuff like that. Is that right? Yeah. Um, before we get to um, 
uh, semi-tough. The novel that you mentioned, let's talk about another novel, uh, mm -hmm. North Dallas 40 uh, by Peter. Is it Peter Gent or Peter Gent? I always say Gent. So. Okay. Um, one of our questions in our, in our, in our Q&A uh, says, the question is, who really wrote North Dallas 40? And there's a smiley face there. Uh, but it is an interesting story about, about, how, about how that book came to be. Uh, Peter Gent is your one non-native Texan, of course. Uh, he was born in Michigan but and played basketball at Michigan State, uh, but played for the Dallas Cowboys in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, and then wrote this famous novel, North Dallas 40, that made quite a splash. So who really wrote North Dallas 40, Steve? I'd love to love to hear the opinion of the person who asked that question. <laughs> uh, you know, what I say in the book is what Bud Trake told me that, you know, yeah. And I think Peter Gent was capable of, I mean, it's it's his story for sure. And um, it may be, you know, I think, if, okay, if you step back to Billy Lee Bramer, who we haven't talked about, and I think this is this happens with writers. Bramer, when he was working on The Gay Place, his great novel, uh, he was having trouble writing it. And he, he complained to a friend that every, every, other writer I read, I start unconsciously parodying their style. So if Peter Gent was reading Bud Shrake, it's quite possible that North Dallas 40 sounds kind of like a Bud, like Bud Shrake's writing. But Bud did look look over the novel. He told Pete, uh, explained punctuation to him, he said, and he told him, be sure to number your pages because the pages all fell out one time. Putting them back in order was difficult. Um, you know, kind of a facile explanation. But I do see strange peaches at the beginning of the decade in Dallas. And North Dallas 40 at the end of the decade in Dallas, the end of the 60s, as kind of bookends uh, for that city in terms of a literary portrait. It was an is amazing novel. I think Peter Gent did for pro football what the great war correspondents like Michael Hare or Seymour Hirsch did for the Vietnam War. You know, he really exposed the rottenness underneath the veneer and shows what was really happening. I mean, it's a bit exaggerated of a portrait. But I think his themes are spot on. They've been validated ever since, honestly. You know, you think about the issue of concussions in football and how, yeah. And, and also this novel, it took on America's team, you know, the, the saintly Dallas Cowboys at that time. And so it created quite a stir. You know, when I was working on this book, you know, I, of course, read North Dallas 40 back in the day and semi-tough back in the day. And I reread that North Dallas 40 at least when I read it 20 years ago, when I read this book, still held up really well. I have a feeling it probably still kind of holds up pretty well in a lot of ways. Um, he really, um, yeah, there's, you know, you see just, I wonder if I have quotes about this somewhere. I thought I did. Oh, here we go. I do. Let's see. Okay. So, so here's, so Jen, you know, it's a Romana clip. So you have, Clearly, the quarterback is Don Meredith. The quarterback of the novel sings, turn out the lights, the party's over. This is what Don Meredith was doing on the set of Monday Night Football every Monday for millions of Americans in their homes. And, um, you know, there's just so many scenes where the team has football players uh, sign autographed footballs and they get a dime each for every football. And the team turns around and sells those for a job and profit. Um, you know, they do everything they can to cheat these guys. There's buckets full of amphetamines uh, when you walk into the locker room for players to grab and gobble and gent says you know you have these guys who are really strong prone to violence you're giving them amphetamines and just the way that the players are forced to play through injury and this is the quote i want to read this is uh well gent gent's character uh you know says something in the novel about you know um i may have 10 more years in me if i can just master the chemistry of this game because there's so many drugs there's so many shots and there's this scene where Jen's character is seeing the doctor because his leg is in really bad shape. And here's what the doctor says. This is the team doctor. I don't think there's anything bad wrong with your leg. I know it hurts you, but there ain't nothing worse you can do by playing on it. I overheard the coaches talking, and they're beginning to think you're dogging it. Now, you and I know better, but that's what they're saying. So go out and show them something today. And just this kind of, you know, irony throughout uh, is incredible. And Jen's character is terrified of the big, scary redneck players who the only reason he's protected from them attacking him and beating him up is because of his friendship with the quarterback. But, but you know, even this ill-educated redneck player, Obi Meadows, uh, understands what's happening with, with the Dallas Cowboys. He, 
he attacks an assistant coach and he screams at him. Every time I try to call it a business, you say it's a game. Every time I say it should be a game, you call it a business. And that's basically how the players were treated. I don't know. It's changed much, Aaron? Do you have an opinion on that? Or? Yeah, I think every time you, you read a sort of a frank player's depiction, uh, they all deal with issues of pain, with issues of drugs, with issues of this ambivalence that, that the judge brought out about, on the one hand, loving football, on the other hand, hating football. <laughs> um, I think what makes the novel so powerful, right, is that it plugs in particular into the kind of the zeitgeist of the, of the early 70s, uh, this sort of growing distrust of authority, uh, especially as manifested by the Tom Landry character and the Gil Brandt character. Uh, I think of that scene uh, in the novel with the um, where they do the psychological evaluations on, on these little right. cards, right? Uh, but he'd read somewhere that uh, they that they were pinching holes, uh, uh, poking holes in the cards so they could tell which player uh, was was answering the questions was supposed to be anonymous. Um, so you know, it it makes such an interesting contrast with the other novel that we mentioned, Semi Tough. Uh, by Dan Jenkins, which I think came out the, the previous year in 72, if I remember right. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, this is a novel that became, if if North Dallas 40 was almost like like a you know a, a conversation piece, right? It was very, it was highly talked about, but semi tough was a publishing phenomenon. And, and you know, basically made Jenkins a millionaire. Um what what explains its appeal? Why why was it such a resonant book with so many people? Oh, that's a great question. You know, uh, I've tried to figure that out myself because mm -hmm. um, when I read it as like a teenager, I thought it was appealing, you know, when mm -hmm. I was a teenager in the seventies. But um, when I read it later as, as a older, older person, it, it was not as appealing. And um, so I've tried to figure that out. I have a few ideas that I can throw out there. One is that Jenkins was a star writer at Sports Illustrated. You know, a lot of people knew, knew his work. He was a player, the media knew him. He knew, how to make friends, influence people, all that kind of stuff. Um, and when he was writing in Sports Illustrated, it was like G-rated material. Semi-tough has a hard R. You know, there's lots of sex, there's orgies, there's just all kinds of language. And the thing is, Jenkins, he channels that player, um, the good old boy, Billy Clyde Puckett, as the narrator for this novel, who is doing a um, as-told to biography to the fake sports writer. Uh, is it Jim Tom Pinch? Jim so, Tom Pinch. <laughs> so you have Billy Clyde Puckett just being able to like talk about whatever he wants to talk about, which of course is exactly what Dan Jenkins has been doing as Collins for years and years. Um, in this case, uh, Billy Clyde Puckett, uh, just his views of women, his views of minorities, he uses lots of horrible words. You know, he basically, lots of ethnic jokes, jokes about women's sexuality, lots of really obscene, gratuitous language. And he, he showed the manuscript to his friend, Bud Schrake. And Bud said, he had advised Jenkins, oh, you gotta take out a lot of those ethnic jokes. You gotta tone down like the needless obscenity. And Jenkins was like, hmm. So Jenkins went and talked to his editor and his editor said, Bud's full of crap. You need to put in more of that stuff, more of it. And so what do I know? Because this book came out and it was a huge phenomenon. Yeah. It, you know, sold millions of copies and people absolutely loved it. And I think just because it was such a refreshing take, like, you know, we'd gone through so much turmoil as a society, at least I'm speaking for mostly white readers here, who were like, oh, there's so much, you know, anxiety about, you know, integration and civil rights and riots and all this stuff going on, women's liberations coming up, you know, Finally, uh, we have this guy who's just kind of speaking for us in a way, you know, just somebody like epitome of white privilege, essentially. You can just like dish off this commentary about people who aren't like him and make it all funny. I don't know. If you, if you think about how in just in American life in general, by the late 60s and early 70s, you're starting to see the political polarization is very much defining who we are today. And sports kind of reflects that in a lot of ways. You've got heroes who appeal to one political side, perhaps more than the other. If you think about a Kareem Abdul Gabbar or a um, on, on one side, or uh, or Joe Namath, right? These are figures who are sort of polarizing in, ter in terms of the uh, kinds of people who lo love them and hate them. Um, and the, these two novels, both that are sort of Texas football centered, 
um, you know, North Dallas 40 is, is a novel of the left, right? And, and in a lot of ways, uh, semi-tough is a novel of the right. <laughs> um, it's, at least it's, it's trying to find uh, an old comfortable consensus. Uh, it's, it's not sort of a hard, you know, a hard charging uh, political novel by any means, but more just things could be like they used to be, sort of, right? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So before we finish up and and turn to more uh, uh, questions from the audience, tell us a little bit more about the legacies as you see it of these of of the Mad Dogs of the Texas Literary Outlaws. You know, what do they mean for sports writing history? What do they mean for the literary culture of Texas? And to connect with that question, um, we have a, another question in the Q and A that asks you, was there a second or third wave of literary outlaws in Texas who followed in the wake of Shrake and the other writers? Any other writers who tried to do literary journalism, new journalism, narrative nonfiction about race, sports, politics, music, uh, folks who are trying to do on uh, in their own way what Tom Wolf or Gay Talese or Bud Shrake had done. Um, and that's maybe a, can connect them to thinking about their legacies. Um, yeah, that's great questions. I love the questions. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, as far as legacies, uh, you know, in terms of sports writing, it, I mean, you said it earlier, you know, Dan Jenkins is regarded as really the star sports writer, influential sports writer of the 1960s, along with Frank DeFord at, at Sports Illustrated. Um, you know, I think Jenkins, because he did often rely on this, like, really his funny, hilarious writing as comic one-liners and stuff, that was kind of his reputation. So those are his strengths, and that's what he engaged in. So he didn't really do, he wasn't known for doing a lot of reporting or that much really analysis. So his legacy among his peers, I think he was influential to a degree, but, you know, I talk about this in the book. It took 20 years for him to get elected to the Sports Writing Hall of Fame, which is elected by your peers. I'm not sure what was going on there. He was left out of David Halberstam's collection of the greatest American sports writing in the 20th century. You know, those things had to sting him a little bit, but I mean, he's laughing all the way to the bank too because he kept publishing more novels and they all did mostly did pretty well so he definitely found his groove and knew how to write it um but i think and he's the only one i would consider having a legacy in terms of sports writing unless you want to consider peter jent's novel but the legacy for this group overall i think is pretty clear and you know it's substantial this these are writers who came of age at a time of incredible transformation in Texas, you know, from a rural to urban society, the great issues of the day were race, and they were writing about that. You know, Bud Shrake was on the front lines in Dallas, 19, 1963. He was writing about that again from an eyewitness perspective. Um, Billy Lee Bramer writing about Lyndon Johnson, who he worked for. So when you have this kind of historical viewpoint, you have these really gifted, observant writers. Who are writing about the major issues of a pretty significant time in Texas history and their work stands. And I have a quote from Larry O. King actually I want to bring up here because this kind of speaks to that. Um, King said, uh, my writing has been about and it was meant to be about the Texas of my time there. I felt it my job to define and record Texas culture as I best knew it and to leave signposts saying to those who come along later, this is how it was then. And I think this generation, you know, Larry McMurtry is a terrific, had a terrific career. He gets a lot more attention, not to mention Corrette McCarthy. But I think if you're going kind of for a historical view of what was happening in Texas, these these writers did a pretty good job in a lot of ways. They really did peel back the curtain and show us what was behind. I think your readers are interested to learn more about the, the topic you discussed in the book, now that you mentioned Larry McMurtry, about McMurtry's sort of uneasy relationship uh, with the Mad Dogs. Yeah. Definitely. Um, you know, there were people were competitive, but Murtry mm -hmm. uh, he showed that many times. And yeah, they were friendly ish, but yeah, they're, and the, you know, McMurtry was, McMurtry was a cool guy in his own way. He was very, very bookish. He had lots of women friends around the country. I mean, you know, he was a, he had a different life. He wasn't out partying all the time like so many of these people were doing out. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Drugs is a big part of the story too, right? I'm sorry? Drugs is a big part of uh, the story in a lot of ways. Um, we see, you know, Billy Ridley Bramer uh, suffering from never being able to replicate the success of a gay place and, you know, drinking himself out of jobs. And uh, Peter Jack goes on to have a very sort of checkered life after 
Absolutely. After this time. And I wonder also with, with Jen, uh, I meant to ask you this question. Uh, had you written that book maybe 10 or 15 years later, do you think you might have talked about him in terms of CTE as, as a potential uh, factor uh, in, in terms of uh, his very difficult uh, later life? Yeah, that, that's a great observation. Mm -hmm. um, I really thought about that, but it makes a lot of sense. When mm -hmm. you, you know, and actually I should talk about the generation after the Mad Dogs. They're, yeah. they're, I think uh, Diana Finley, who's a cool writer who lives in San Marcos and uh, written a really good book on Delbert McClinton. I think uh, she mentioned, like, she called them, I think, the mad puppies in a way. <laughs> the, the great journalist Jan Reed, who was a sports writer here in Texas and then became a really terrific writer at Texas Monthly. And yeah, you had a generation younger, younger than that. I can think of writers uh, I admire today who had that kind of same, just sort of rewilling sensibility where they're going to just say what what they think the the truth is and and you know um yeah it's it's definitely a a vibe that you get okay. we uh encourage our uh, audience uh, to please feel free to drop in more questions into the q a uh we still have about uh 10 to 15 minutes where we have time to ask you questions uh, so we'd really love to hear any questions that you have um Wow, that's happening. Steve, tell us about what you're working on these days. Ah, well, um, <laughs> you know, just lots of different things. So mm -hmm. here at Whitliff, uh, which is where I am now, I'm on the mm -hmm. top floor of the Alkek Library, looking out into the darkness over the campus at Texas State University. Um, and this is a place that just, uh, it's a center of creativity. You know, we collect all these terrific writers, we have their papers. And, uh, you know, one of the things I get to do is be the editor of our series press, which is something you know about, Aaron. And mm -hmm. it's fun to help put together deserving books and have them come out. Um, you know, we are in the process of publishing the first ever literary anthology devoted to African-American writers in Texas. I'm working with the great journalist in San Antonio, Gary Clack, who's editing that. So we're excited about that. You know, we've earlier published the first ever anthology devoted to Mexican American writers in Texas. Um, there's a terrific uh, professor out in Lubbock, Cordelia Barrera, who's done an anthology of women writing about sense of place in the Southwest. So just to be in this kind of environment is just such a joy. Um, yeah, and I have my own projects I'm working on on the side. Um, yeah, let's see, I just, finished a book manuscript that's at University of New Mexico Press called uh, Beating Heart of the World, uh, the Taos Art Colony, the Pueblo Resistance, and the Plot to Revitalize Indigenous America. And this is the story of how the art colony in Taos uh, was founded about the same time that the Pueblo Indians were being targeted for extinction by the US government in the early 20th century. The Pueblo people were some of the last holdouts maintaining their traditional life ways and their lands, most importantly. Mm -hmm. and the government at the behest of New Mexico land hungry politicians was going after them. And so somehow the, the people in the art colony and the Pueblo resistance came together and really tried to turn back the tide of conquest and kind of at least stemmed the tide of conquest in the end. Uh, we're able to create enduring legislation called the Indian New Deal, which uh, stopped the government from trying to, you can no longer wipe out Indian languages, uh, Indian religion, uh, Indian cultures, arts and crafts reprises led to the revitalization of Indian arts and crafts movement. So it's kind of a cool story. It's a lot of fun to work on. That sounds terrific. That sounds you know, terrific. I, I love these stories of people coming together to make positive mm -hmm. change. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. so there's that there's another sports writer george or sometimes sports writer named george plunter who said you know any good story has a bunch of people who uh, they see a mountain they go up it and they come down right? <laughs> it sounds like that uh like, you know, that's what's happening with, with a number of your words that's great that's great to see we have a question in the chat box uh that's asking who do you see today in texas literature or art uh who embodies the spirit of the outlaws uh, you know, that's kind of a political question. I don't know if I can answer that. I mean, I, I, can, <laughs> I can think of some people, but I'm not sure because in terms of writing and reporting, yes. But in terms of substance abuse, no, I don't know <laughs> like that. Um, but, you know, there are some terrific uh, 
younger writers out there who are doing things. And, and honestly, you know, I, I love how Texas literature has become so much more wide open. Uh, this was a time where basically white men were the ones doing all the writing and all the publishing. And we have so many terrific women writers in Texas. You know, we have many great writers from all across the spectrum. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what excites me. Um, but in terms of writers like this, uh, I mean, I can mention a couple. <laughs> uh, there's, you know, Wes Ferguson, who writes for Texas Monthly, who uh, is just, you know, I think Norman Mailer said to Larry O'King, you know, guys like us, we're big bears, you know, we're going to get out there and we're going to fight to get our story and tell it our way. And, uh, you know, Wes is that kind of guy. He's done some amazing writing for Texas Monthly. His friend, Christian Wallace, also, uh, they're both incredibly talented writers. Uh, Christian, damn, I remember the first thing he wrote for Texas Monthly. You know, he grew up in West Texas and uh, worked in the oil patch for a bit to get money to go to school. And he wrote this amazing piece about what that was like. You know, this is at least as good as what Larry L. King had written, you know, years earlier about working in the oil patch. So it was amazing stuff. And uh, they're both doing great things, but they're, you know, so many writers out there. Uh, I think of my friend, Kip Stratton, who writes for Texas Highways, Texas uh, Monthly. And, you know, he's uh, just out kind of ex exploring the Comanche trails into Texas and just, you know, there, there's that, kind of spirit of this all throughout Texas. Um, and I think, you know, earlier I wrote about J. Frank Doby, who was a very influential writer, 1920s to the 1950s. And you don't really see his influence today, but the stuff that he did is now kind of threaded so much into the culture, you can't really say, oh, this was Doby, because, you know, writing does kind of evolve in that way. And that's, that's what happened, you know, some things these people were doing. Um, when you talk about eyewitness literature, uh, which, I think is a great concept to describe what they did. There are lots of terrific writers in Texas who've done, there's Americo Paredes, a great Mexican American writer who wrote a firsthand novel about what it was like growing up in the Rio Grande Valley in the early, early 20th century. And that was a novel and it was, you know, decades ahead of where the historians got to, you know, it took the historians until the 1980s to, 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 figure out the same themes that Paredes was writing about, uh, you know, the 1930s. Uh, people like Winifred Sanford, you know, one of my beefs with Texas historians is they spend a lot of time talking about the Alamo and stuff like that. And, you know, relatively little attention on uh, contemporary Texas. And that's why I think this contemporary novelist can do such a great job illuminating things. Um, and so I think of like somebody like Winifred Sanford back in the 1920s, who was writing about the Texas oil boom writing these beautiful stories. They were, uh, I think four of her, she appeared four times in Best American Short Stories, like in one year. She was writing for H.L. Mencken. And just her, you have somebody who's really smart, really observant, perceptive, explaining the transformative changes of the Texas oil boom on people and their lives. And, you know, the male historians would go back, or the male writers would talk about, you know, how much money was being made or how many you know, miles of pipeline related or stuff like that. But Winifred was really writing about the human stories. And uh, so, you know, I love writers who are doing stuff like that. I keep going, but it, maybe we have more questions. I don't know. Okay, we'd love to see them uh, placed to the, into the Q&A. Uh, so please feel free to jump in, uh, any audience member with any questions. And, you know, we didn't really talk about Lil, Billy Lee Bramer, who- Yeah. A little bit of sports writing, and he was, you know, very gifted writer. And he really, you know, the influence that Blackie Sherrod had on Dan Jenkins and Gary Cartwright, uh, and to a degree, Bud Shrake, um, Billy Lee Bramer, uh, when he published The Gay Place in 1961, this was a novel that put uh, LBJ kind of at the center of his novel, but it was really about his, his dissolute set of friends in Austin as liberal disaffected friends who experienced a lot of ennui and were, you know the counterculture was just around the corner you kind of sense it in Bramer's novel and for people like Bud Shrake who thought you know I have to become a foreign correspondent to find material or I have to write an old west novel to get published seeing Bramer write about 
the world they all knew and having a big hit with it was hugely influential so you know there's that too right and i think that's a sort of a running theme through the book is that these all these writers find experience in texas and, and material in texas that that shapes them in all the different directions that they go which includes sports uh but, but transcend sports as well yeah and you think um, about larry, larry mcmurchie who we brought up earlier you know mm -hmm. uh bill Broyles, you know who was a student of larry's at rice and larry was reading aloud pieces from the last picture show while he was working on that and mm -hmm. Royals and Greg Curtis, both of who were, became Texas Monthly editors, um, were just a god because I think Bill said something like, "This is the first time I realized it's amazing writing about people we knew, you know, in, in a novel. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's very liberating to have those kinds of things happen." Kind of a related question just just came in. Uh, one of our audience members asked, "Is Texas a different place to be a writer in? Is it more challenging here, or is it a boon to writers because of all the crazy material that's available?" <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 never easy to be a writer if you're trying to make a living at it. You know, I have a I have one of the greatest day jobs you could ever ask for because I get to be around these crazy writers a lot and deal with creative people and try to make good things happen here at the Whitliff. So, um, but you know, it's it's a hard it's it's hard to hard to be if any of you out there are watching your writers, you know, um, I have a friend who wrote a really terrific novel. And I think every writer reaches this point where, um, I know I did, but you know, when you first get published, you're so excited because your book comes out and then you go on tour. And I realized that the book tour is God's way of restoring uh, an equilibrium <laughs> designed to deflate your ego in every possible way and to make you realize that you don't matter. But then, you know, you do another book and, and I think you, you reach a point when you publish books because writers can lie and say, oh, I'm doing it because I believe in, you know, telling this story. But, you know, you do it because you want people to pay attention to what you have to say. And at some point, it feels like you just kind of like top out at what at what you're saying or how much people care. And then you you have to kind of, and this is what happened to this friend of mine. He was like, I don't know if I want to write anymore. I really thought this novel I wrote was going to like be a big thing. And it just found the same, you know, thousand readers or 2000 readers or whatever. And I think, you know, there's just so much, uh, so much you really it's almost you have to be have a kind of a disease to write i think to keep writing um you know i think of people like rick riordan who uh you know is his percy jackson uh books are now the subject of a disney uh streaming series on the lightning thief and rick is a cool guy and a great writer you know when he tried to publish his first novel he had so many rejection letters you know that's just in the archive, you, you see that it's so common um, that, yeah, it's not an easy life, but where would we be without writers? I think it's just, it's, I mean, that's, I, that's how I've learned most of the things I learned, not sitting in classrooms, honestly, but, you know, that's it. Well, I think that is a nice spot to end on, right? The, the value of writing, the value of literature, um, and through the lives of these characters that we've profiled here in, in Steve's book. Uh, we see it in particular in its shaping about the larger conversations about sports in Texas and then into the country as a whole. I hope everyone uh, here uh, enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, well, thanks to Steve for a wonderful conversation. Uh, and thanks to Humanities Texas for hosting us once again. Uh, we'll look forward to the next installment of Sports in the Lone Star State. You'll be hearing more from Humanities Texas when it's ready. Thanks very much and have a great evening.